الحمد لله نحمده على كل حال الحمد لله القاهر فوق عباده إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وحده لا شبيه له وحده لا مثيل له وحده لا وليد له لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار وهو على كل شيء قدير وهو على كل شيء شهيد فعال لما يريد وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وأسوتنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا من يطع الله ورسوله وقل الأمر من المؤمنين فهو على صراط مستقيم ومن يعص الله ورسوله وقل الأمر من المؤمنين فهو في ضلال مبين أما بعد Brothers and sisters committed Muslims We will continue to try to bring down the barriers of ignorance We place our trust in Allah لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا ما آتاها Allah does not burden a person except for what he has given him or within the potential of what he has given him. You and I are privy to the developments of our time. We have been trying to concentrate our mind on what developed and undeveloped in our past and at the same time taking into consideration what is happening and what is in the making in our own time. We seek not to lose sight of these two separate time frames so to speak bombs are going off innocent people 
are being killed and as far as the Muslim public mind is concerned it is supposed to be absent from these events we are trying to have that absence eliminated so that we are at least enlightened and involved in our conscience and in our mind with what is happening. The results are on Allah. We are not responsible for the results. We do our duty. We try as much as possible to express the truth. And from there on, wherever that goes and how far that goes is no longer my or your immediate responsibility. With the bombs that are going off and the explosives that are shattering lives, in today's world, if you tuned in to the past week's news and if you've listened to today's news, you will know exactly what we are referring to. And these khutbas are in the context of these unraveling events. We are now somewhat familiar with the way politics and decision-making in Islam have gone in the past 14 centuries. We should be aware of that because we are a continuum. Anyone who comes to you and tries to convince you that what happened during the Prophet's time or after that or in between that time and now and you have nothing to do with that, you place that person at a distance. We are a continuation of those generations. We want to make a better future than the mistakes that were committed in the past. كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمَ وَخَيْرُ the Prophet says, all the descendants of Adam are error prone. And the best of these error prone individuals are those who make amends with Allah. But how can we do that if we are not conscious of what we have done? or what we are doing. And this is the consciousness that we try to inspire from this position. In the course of this history, we can, obviously we can't take individual by individual or ruler by ruler. We have to look at time frames after time frames. In the past couple of hundred years, there have been some individuals who sensed, who realized that the political direction of the Muslims has been off course and something has to be done about it. Some of the Muslims, and we're speaking about hundreds of millions of Muslims, not speaking about an intellectual elite, we are not speaking about a subdivision of Islamic schools of thought, 
We're speaking about the Muslim public mind. Within this general, global, Muslim public mind, there is the acknowledgement that there were individuals who tried to correct the Islamic political course. Some of these Muslims, they take an individual who was born and raised in Arabia, as in about 200 and some odd years ago, they take him to be a reformer who sought to correct the mistake that have become part of Muslim life. And this individual is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. He is considered by some to be a person who had a corrective program. We seek to say that more investigation has to be done concerning what is meant by a corrective program attributed to him and to those who call themselves Wahhabi. We want to know what is the correction here. If by correction you mean that there were public notions and general misconceptions that the Muslims were plagued with because of a social and a political environment that did not feed the mind. In other words, some Muslims were going to graves and worshipping graves. We know any person who has just a shallow understanding of Islam knows that Muslims are not permitted to worship graves. If there were individuals or communities or larger or smaller numbers of people who were doing that and they had to be corrected then the correction is due. There's no argument about that. We don't elevate, Muslims don't elevate human beings and make out of them deities. But how do you go about doing that? If a group of people are traditionally Muslims, and they offer their reverence to a grave of a dead person. When you go up to them, you kill them because they are doing that? Or you sit with them and you follow the Qur'an. أُدْعُوا إِلَى سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِظَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنٌ You call to the direction of Allah, you call to Allah Himself with wisdom and with acceptable or decent speech. And if you want to discuss or debate, or dialogue, a matter with them, you do it with courtesy. What was done here, and we don't want to dwell on this character because the information around him is dubious. One of the 
things that he did was he goes to Karbala and the dome in the masjid of Imam al Hussein is destroyed and then around 2,000 people are killed. This is not the way Muslims are supposed to correct themselves. If there are Muslims who need to be corrected. But that was not part of our history, whether we want to look at it or whether we want to look the other way. We've been looking the other way for a long time. And if we, we've reached the dire straits we are in because we have been looking the other way. It's about time that we begin to look at our own self. This is part of us. This is part of our larger social self. We begin to look at it. What justifies doing something like that? For those who hold the opinion that this type a foray with the bloody consequences that it had and with the after effects that we are still living with. If anyone agrees with that, let us hear from them. But as far as we understand Allah and His Prophet, this is not a conduct of a Muslim who seeks to advise or to correct his fellow Muslims. We can go on to another personality that saw in the course of Islamic life something is wrong. The words of the Quran, Iqra and Qum, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al insana min alaq. اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم كلا إن الإنسان لا يطغى أن رآه استغنى إن إلى ربك الرجع. This cluster of آيات and يا أيها المدثر قم فأنذر وربك فكبر and this cluster of ayat need, need now a human effort they just no, don't need to be read it's not enough just to vocalize these ayat what is needed are human beings who can actualize these ayat. And so we had another person who comes along roughly also around 200 years ago and he also tries to bring back the by now lost effort. person's name is Muhammad ibn Ali al-Sanusi. Now this is a person who was born in today's Algeria. And he saw, he lived in a context of time in which the Europeans were coming into Muslim lands. The French were beginning their colonization of northern Africa and he was brought up realizing what the colonialists wanted to do with the Muslims on one side and what the Muslims have done to themselves on the other side. He grew up, of course he was educated in Islamic what may pass at the time as academic circles and he realized how the Muslims themselves were ignorant 
going from country to country, he went from Algeria, what is today called Algeria, he went to Egypt, he went to Arabia, he went to the Hajj, he went to Libya, and he realized that the forces now that impact human Islamic existence are two major forces. The first one is the condition, the condition of a low-level Islamic living. This has its negative impact on the Muslims. And then the Europeans now who are bringing in their armies to occupy and control Muslim lands. He sees this as a Muslim should see it. فَإِنَّ الْعِزَّةَ لِلَّهِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ This عزة belongs to Allah and His Apostle and to the committed Muslims. But he looks around and he says, where's this Izza? We encounter an individual, a person, a Muslim, who has an element that many Muslims today don't have. Many Muslims today are satisfied not to have this Izza. He looks around and he says, no, I'm not satisfied with this. We have to do something about it. And after experience in life, contact, obtaining correct and relevant information, movement around different Islamic areas, this is what he, this was his own ijtihad. He was influenced by at tasawwuf in Islam. And mind you, at that time, Sufism or tasawwuf was used by the colonialists to hush up and to bring down any Islamic voice or any Islamic character that had the courage to step out of the miserable conditions that the Muslims found themselves in. So when someone says mutasawwif or Sufi, don't automatically think that that's something good or that that is something bad. Depends on who you're speaking about. In this case, he figured that the Muslims are going to need a protracted struggle with the internal and the external enemy. And he set up what he called Zawiyah. He set up around 200 Zawiyah. These were concentrated in North Africa and Central Africa. Some of them were also in Arabia. And what were these Zawaya? First of all, they were located in places that were thought out. Either they were on commercial routes, or they were in areas that had substantial living conditions, such as flowing water, or artesian water or some type of source of water or they were in military sensitive locales and the way he was brought up in life he would study half a day and then the other half of his day was spent in what is called some people call today martial arts or military training. When he placed into this immense geography 
دي زوايا they were run like a combination of what is today called communes or this was called back in the 60s and 70s communes and military bases at the same time the people who were living there were required to volunteer one full day that was Thursday they would go out and work the fields or do what is done without any compensation this was for their collective selves no one was being paid for it after Jumu'ah prayers they would go out and exercise society would exercise for the future military encounter and they fought against French colonialism and they tried to contribute to bringing about a correction in the direction of the Muslims another effort that was also to fill in between Iqra and Qum the ayat that we previously referred to was by Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Mahdi in Sudan this was another person who came from a very poor family his family used to work what is called hard labor fixing some marine vessels some boats or ships didn't have the money to go to school but nevertheless one of these souls who could see the pathetic condition that the Muslims are in you come to ask yourself where are today's souls who have that caliber of character who can look and evaluate the condition of the Muslims and he also began to school himself the best he could until finally he also determined that British colonialism has to be stopped has to be eliminated What, is, what becomes at this time a common denominator in the efforts of these sensitive and motivated individuals is that they almost equated I'm trying to be somewhat sensitive and accurate about this these individuals equated the the Ottoman rulers or their vassals such as was the case in Egypt with the colonialists themselves now this was not an attempt by them to weaken Islamic self-rule as much as it was trying to recapture the independence and the integrity of Islamic power and Islamic politics Therefore, they had their serious brush with the government in Cairo, in Egypt, as well as the Ottoman Sultan, who was at that time somewhat of a respondent to European pressures. In other words, if the war somehow was going negative, 
for the Islamic power in Istanbul vis-a-vis the European powers there may be some negotiations and throughout these negotiations the European colonialists would tell the Asitana or Istanbul look we, we are encountering some troublemakers in North Africa we want you to help us out and no one should be surprised if we have been looking at the gradual deterioration of Islamic rule that has been going on for over a thousand years, yes, we will have a sultan or we will have a a ruler who is a client of the European powers. And that's what we had at that time. These fought and they scored victories. And they were not there to say, let's say, at the Sawwuf has nothing to do with our military spirit. That wasn't known to them. But we have then and today the same types of people who come and tell you, you want to be a Sufi, you can't think about military affairs. You can't think about the military world around. heard a couple of years ago that they are trying to get a Sufi trend here in the United States. But they don't want a Sufi trend like a Senussi or Al Mahdi or Omar Al Mukhtar or the others who fought against colonialism. No, they don't want that. They want their own type. And they're probably behind the scenes still working on this project. They probably ran into some difficulties. And so right now they say, let us do more work behind the scenes than coming out in public and speaking about this whole affair. So these were the rumblings inside the Muslim body that tried within the context of their own geography and their own societies and their own times, they try to make the Islamic difference. They were followed by another generation who are favorably looked upon by the Islamic efforts of today. They were like considered the precursors to the Islamic movement of today and the Islamic commitment of today. First one is Jamal al-Din Afghani or Asad Abadi. This person, first of all, What is unique about him is no one really knows whether this person was a Sunni or a Shiite. Everyone claims him. Why? Because he was above and beyond the trivial differences now in today's world that classify one person a Sunni and another person a Shiite. Obviously, he was born in Afghanistan. His lineage goes back to Al Imam Al Hussein. He was schooled in. Islamic academics if we can use that word here but in addition to that he also gained the type of knowledge that may be called secular knowledge and he went from his home country to India at that time the British 
were the colonial power there. And they sent this person here after a short while should not be around. So they forced him to leave. He went from India to Egypt. Once again, British colonialism was in Egypt. And after a while he had to leave. And he began going from country to country. It's almost like you couldn't keep up with him. To Turkey, to different parts of Europe, back to India, back to Egypt, to Iran, to Iraq. He was all over the map. But what is clear about him is, from the viewpoint of the Muslims of today, looking back at him, him was that he was a contribution to this spirit that is needed in today's world. His duplicates are very rare. He had a student, Muhammad Abdu, an Egyptian who was also born to a poor family. There's a message in this poor, coming from a poor, a poverty-stricken background. And he made his way, he went to Al-Azhar, and he got turned off by the way knowledge is being taught in this Azhar. And he came in contact with Jamal al-Din Asad Abadi or Jamal al-Din Afghani. He came in contact with him. And now there was room for his mind to flourish. But the Azhar took issue with him. As it took issue with the Sanusi before him. The Shaykh of the Azhar at that time told this Sanusi, I'm going to go and kill you. He threatened him. This was the Shaykh of the Azhar. And this was one of the people's personalities. Both of them on opposite sides. The same thing here, once again, we find that the Azhar, there was an attempt to use it against budding minds and against lively spirits. And he himself had a run-in, just like Jamal al-Din, Muhammad Abdu had a run-in with those who call themselves people of fiqh, because they refused to activate their minds, to think more about what Allah and His Prophet are saying to them. Obviously, they don't have in a very limited quarter of establishmentarian or status quo Muslims a favorable image. But that is only a small and limited section of the Muslims. Add to that the rejuvenating efforts of two other people in Syria, Abdul Rahman al Kawakibi, and in Al Maghrib, Abdul Hamid bin Badi. These were individuals also who sought a change, who worked on realigning the Muslim public with what it means to be their own decision makers. We want to note here that Mecca was a magnet to them. They could, any time they felt little pressure in Morocco, in Algeria, in Sudan, in Syria, in Turkey, in Afghanistan, wherever, 
they felt pressure, they would go to Mecca. Abd al-Rahman al-Kawakibi went to Mecca and inside Mecca had a secret meeting with the scholars of the Muslims to try to bring everyone together for an all-out movement. Sanusi had a statement, he said, we want to bring the Muslims together from, from Ghana to Fargana. They were not some local chaps who were going to be satisfied with a very limited Islamic ambition in their own geographical area or in the country that they came from. They were looking at the Muslims as a body of people in the world, and they belong to this body. There is not going to be any sectarianism or any nationalism in their way, such as has become the case with some of today's shining Muslim figures. Ibn Badis, when he went to Mecca, he met Algerian ulama. This was the time when Mecca was open. No one was telling you, you can't come to Mecca, or you cannot have a meeting in Mecca, or you cannot have a conference in Mecca. The Algerian ulama told him, why don't you have a hijra? Come and settle in Mecca. He said to them, نَحْنُ حُرَّاسِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَالْعَرَبِيَّةِ وَالْوَطَنْ كُلِّهِ We are the custodians of Islam. The language of the Qur'an, al arabiya and all of this homeland of ours. al kawakibi it is said, was poisoned to death. By whom, of all people, Sultan Abdul Hamid, who was, at that time, whatever was left, the faint figure of a Muslim central authority. What are we going to do? We're going to take a look at this and say none of this happened. This is exactly what the status quo establishment type of Muslims want you and me to be. None of this history, none of this experience, none of these details, don't even think about that. All of this experience, all of this history, what we can learn from this, how we can ferment our public minds on this, none of that is permitted to be around. And we are supposed to make do with the orders that come to us via the financial channels of a contemporary, and this is between quotes, Islamic movement. Our movement is not going to learn. We are not going to progress if we're not able to locate ourselves dead center in the middle of our historical experience and dead center within the middle of our geographical existence. 
not being placed in the margins because we are of a certain school of thought or placed in the margins because we come from a certain country. These are alien concepts that have divided us, pulverized us, and rendered us what we have become today. Where are the Muslims who can emerge from this and recapture the spirit and the intent of Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq and then Ya ayyuhal muddathir hum fa'anthir Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum Ad'uhu subhanah wa antum ala yaqeenan bil ijabah wa tubu ila Allah غافر الذنب وقابل التوب شديد العقاب وإليه المصير الحمد لله لجميع المحامد على جميع النعم صلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم My brothers, my sisters, committed Muslim In the course of the time frame and development that we are trying to reclaim with thinking mind with pulsating hearts and an enlightened conscience during the spread of these generations there has been a concept that has worked its way into our thinking and that concept is secularism no one probably could forecast that it's Secularism is going to take its toll on us, but it has. And we have contributed to that. What do you expect when we shut off our thinking and when we don't learn from our mishaps, we create these gaps and one of these major gaps is the gaps of secularism. Secularism may have been an arguable development in Euro-American history. They ran away from an oppressive church. Running away from it necess necessitated a new frame of mind and they found that new frame of mind in their secular pursuits, in their secular theories, in their secular governments. But how about us? What were we running away from? There was nothing equivalent to the church. We don't have a church. We don't have a Rome or a Constantinople. We don't have that. So how come some of us want to hold on to the flimsy explanations that come from secularists? And then when some of us grab on 
to this secular way of life, we try to respond to it. One of the major responses to secularism in our Islamic literature is called Al-Hakimiya. which roughly means governance. The first person to have elaborated on Al-Hakimiya was Al-Marhum Abu Al-A'la Al-Mawdudi. He was the first to come along and realize that there is a gap in the way Muslims have begun to interact with these secular concepts that were moving in with missionaries and with militaries. And he prolifically wrote about this. And this was picked up by other Muslims. But the issue even though this is a very important, very integral part of our Islam, the issue is not only secular politics. Along with that, it is also secular thinking. It is secular economics. It is secular philosophy. It is secular religion itself. And the response can only come from we the Muslims who part company with our own mistakes. When we identify with our past That doesn't mean that we identify with our mistakes. We identify with our own past to isolate our mistakes and not commit them again. Or else we won't be able to make a tawbah for it. If you don't realize your mistakes, if you don't identify your errors, if you don't point out where you went wrong, then how are you going to make tawbah for it? How are you going to ask Allah for forgiveness for that? But if, if altogether you don't want to look at this, you don't want to crank up your thoughts, you don't want to turn on your mind, as is the case now with this Islam of officialdom, then we're going to mark time. We're going to stay exactly where we are with the forces of the world around us setting us back more and more because of our indifference, because of our failure to reconsider who we are. If Allah Jalla wa'ala gives us time into the future we will speak about because it may seem that this is a gloom and doom political area in our Islamic past but we have accomplishment we have contributions to civilization to the human effort to raising the standard of living and the quality of life of human beings on earth. We will try to shed light on that so that we can take a look at, along with what, what went wrong, what we had right. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna al-tiba'a. وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إيمانا
ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم اللهم بارك على محمد وآل محمد اللهم بارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم يعظكم به إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة